one. We are going, you can stand or you may sit. You don't have to stand. We'll say our statements of faith. We believe in God the Father. We believe in Christ the Son. We believe in the Holy Spirit. We believe the three are one. We are the church and we stand as one. We believe in the Holy Bible. We believe in the virgin birth. We believe in the resurrection, that Christ one day will return to earth. We believe in the blood of Jesus. We believe in eternal life. We believe in the blood that frees us to become the bride of Christ. Join with us as we pray. Kind and loving Heavenly Father, as we come before you today, the first thing we wish to say to you is thank you for the gift of your Son, Jesus Christ. We praise him for his commitment to your will above his own as he walked here upon the earth. We ask this morning, Lord, that you would help us to understand and fill our minds and fill our hearts with the deep desire we have to worship our Savior, Jesus Christ. And to realize this morning that the daily leadership of the Holy Spirit is one of the most great blessings we have with our salvation. That when we step aside off the path that that still small voice says you need to get back on. You need to come back closer to Jesus. We strive this morning to have an attitude like Paul did in many ways when he talked about the fact that he pressed toward the mark of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. And we all have a potential that God has placed within us that by His Spirit direction He will bring to fruition if we walk and serve Him. We ask now for the forgiveness of our sins and our shortcomings and ask, Lord, that in all these things you would be lifted up above all else. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. When I pray soft and low, when I pray this I know, God will always hear, God will always hear. Y'all know something? When I get to heaven, I'll walk good. You certainly will, you I hope so. <laughs> I hope so. Good morning. Good morning. Okay, I'm going to try that again. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Better. <laughs> I'm losing my hearing, so y'all have to speak up. Uh, good to see everybody here today. Uh, gonna have a uh, wonderful baptism here in a little while. Looking forward to that. If uh, you'll look on the left hand side of your bulletin this morning, uh, February 21st, which is a week from tomorrow, Jennifer Walder will come uh, to the WMU meeting. Uh, that Monday and will be the guest speaker. Uh, she will be talking about their mission work and uh, the job that they have been doing spreading the word around in uh, I believe it's Peru. Yes. Not Peru. 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 Yeah. Um, so uh, wonderful wonderful guest speaker. Come be a part of that ladies. I think you'll uh, You'll really enjoy what she has to say. I think you'll find it extremely interesting that uh, you will probably come away from that meeting uh, realizing how blessed you really are and how many of the creature comforts of life you take for granted uh, when you're down in the mountains of Peru having to speak another language with people that are still considered tribes yeah. in the jungles and mountains of Peru. So come be a part of that week from tomorrow, uh, which is February 21st, which also happens to be my anniversary. Now, if I can just remember that a week from tomorrow, I'll be, I'll be fine. <laughs> I'll give you a call. Give me a call? I'll give okay. you a call. 
Uh, church is going through a deep cleaning. I see here they're consolidating the three rooms where we have tons and tons of floral arrangements. We're going to try to, some of them probably as old as I am, uh, going to try to get those all consolidated into one room, open up some of these uh, other rooms over here. What we need to do now, after we get the rooms opened up, is fill them up. Amen. Okay. So let's work on that. Um, Annie Armstrong Easter offering and week of prayer is going to be March the 6th through the 13th. Uh, we're going to run the event through the end of March. We will come up with an offering goal. Do we have one yet? We're going to do it tonight. Okay. I'll vote for you. we are come up with a tentative goal, <laughs> and the coach will probably change the game plan. There you go. Before kickoff. So, anyway, uh, speaking of kickoff, go Bengals. Anyway, um, a very disturbing statistic there at the bottom of, the, of your bulletin. Uh, the estimate is 246 million people in North America do not have a relationship with Jesus. Amen. 246 million, million <laughs> people. Okay, that's just in America. Right. Yeah. They live around us, too. Right. Our neighbors. They're our neighbors. Our neighbors, yeah. They're our co workers. Yeah. They're our friends. They're our family. They're our family. Yeah. Okay. So the excuse I don't have anybody to witness to does not fly. Amen. Okay. Does not fly. So if you take that statistic of 246 million people, and you bring that ratio up to the entire world, 7.5 billion people in the world, it's probably 7 billion. Yeah. Okay. Probably about 7 yeah. billion people yeah. don't know about Jesus. Mm -mm. Or they've heard about him, but they have not opened that door that only has the handle on the inside. There is no handle on the outside of your heart. It is only on the inside. So let's keep that in mind. And a um, little fact here, Annie Armstrong taught children's Sunday school class at her church in Baltimore for nearly 50 years. Okay? Had she done it another seven or eight years, she would have caught up with this man. Okay? So we... Uh, we have work to do, people. 246 million people. That's a staggering amount of people. Okay. Anything else? Our uh, luncheon starts at 1 o'clock. The luncheon starts at 1 o'clock. And the pastor is providing the fun part. The pastor is paying for the food. So bring some friends, bring some family, bring some enemies, we'll feed them and turn them into friends. <laughs> Quickest way to turn an enemy into a friend, feed them. <laughs> feed them and tell them the good word. Amen. Okay. Okay, for our first song this morning, if you feel like standing fine, if you want to sit, that's fine too. Let's turn to number 23. God is so good. God, God is so good. God is so good. He's so good to me. He cares for me. He cares for me. He cares for me. He's so good to me. I praise His name. I praise His name, I praise His name, He's so good to me. I praise His name, I praise His name, I praise His name, He's so good to me.
Didn't know we were singing all four verses. That's what you call an audible <laughs> at the goal line. Okay. Uh, y'all can have a seat. Let's turn over. And let's throw the microphone on the floor, and after we do that, let's turn over to number 546. I got it. I've just been I to was sinking deep, deep in sin, far from the peaceful shore, very deeply stained within, sinking to rise no more. But the master of the sea heard my despairing cry, from the waters lifted me, now saved am I. Love lifted me, love lifted me. When nothing else could help, love lifted me, love lifted me, love lifted me. When nothing else could help, love lifted me. All my heart to Him I give, ever to Him I'll cling. In His blessed presence live, ever His praises sing. Love so mighty and so true, merits my soul's best songs. Faithful serving service then to Him belongs. Love lifted me, love lifted me. When nothing else could help, love lifted me. Love lifted me, love lifted me, when nothing else could help, love lifted me. Souls in danger look above, Jesus completely saves. He will lift you by his love out of the angry waves. He's the master of the sea. Billows his will obey. Dear Savior wants to be, be saved today. Love lifted me, love lifted me. When nothing else could help, love lifted me. Love lifted me, love lifted me. When nothing else could help, Love lifted me. The trivia question for the day is what is the number of the offertory hymn? Oh, that would be a good it's 572. <laughs> Let's all stand together. That's another audible. What the universe is I love to tell the story of unseen things above, of Jesus and his glory, of Jesus and his love. I love to tell the story because I know tis true. It satisfies my longing as nothing else can do. I love to tell the story will be my theme in glory to tell the old, old story of Jesus and his love. I love to tell the story, tis pleasant to repeat. What seems each time I tell it, more wonderfully sweet. I love to tell the story, for some have never heard. The message of salvation from God's own holy word. I love to tell the story 
Twill be my theme in glory to tell the old, old story of Jesus and his love. I love to tell the story for those who know it best. Seem hungering and thirsting to hear it like the rest. And when in scenes of glory I sing the new, new song, will be the old, old story that I have loved so long. I love to tell the story will be my theme in glory tell the old old story of jesus and his love brother steve would you lead us as we pray i will i probably that god as we come to you this morning we're just again thankful for the things you provide for us our salvation all things that come our way that are good i know but uh, you are in charge and all the things that come our way that we may not like. You're still in the lead and you're still in charge. And what happens to us is for your honor and glory. We thank you for that. Lord, we just ask that you bless each one that's here this morning. Bless this offering. So we will be continually used for you seven days a week, 24 hours a day. That we don't forget Jesus saved our soul. And we weren't worthy. Amen. Help us to always remember that. Forgive us of our sins, Lord, and be with Brother Doug to give us a message. Let your Holy Spirit just be in divine power. In Jesus' most precious name we pray. Amen. Amen. Just before the message this morning, uh, if you feel like standing, fine. Let's turn to number 244. This morning, let's have silent prayer that some of those 246 million people in this country will come to know Jesus. Amen. Amen.
I don't get too wild, it might stay there. <laughs> Nina just told me she wasn't singing, and in a little while we'll figure out if I'm preaching. <laughs> Does that sound fair enough to everybody? We would like to ask you this morning to uh, join us, please, in your Bible to the book of Ezekiel, chapter 37. One of the things that God promises to his people, that he would bring them back out of the captivity, which they had to be put into because they were not faithful. In Ezekiel 37, begin with me, please, in the 24th verse. For I will take you from among the heathen and gather you out of all the countries, and I will bring you into your own land. And we know that's about a 2,500-year promise before that will come to pass. Then I will sprinkle water upon you, and you shall be clean for all your filthiness, and from all your idols will I cleanse you. Now we know he said that instead of the blood of Jesus that we are cleansed by through faith because Christ had not yet died. Verse 26, he said, I will give a new heart also, I will give it to you, and a new spirit will I put within you. And I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh, and I will give you a heart of flesh. That's a soft, pliable heart. You know, when we're lost, we have a hard, stony heart. It is hard for us to listen to the Word of God. It's hard for us to be open to the Word of God. It's hard for us to allow ourselves to have that approach to God. 36. That's okay. And verse 27, I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and you shall keep my judgments and you shall do them. Now, let's look and see what God's telling us in this passage. First, he speaks to Israel as a nation. He said, I'll bring you back to where you're old and put you back in your own country. Well, it's about 2,500 years before that happens. But God's prophecies are always true. And they always come to pass. Every single one of them. And if we look through our Bible and record those, we find there's never a failure of that to come about. Hence, we have no reason to not trust every verse of prophecy because God will bring it to pass. Now, he then says some interesting things here. Look at verse 26. I'm going to give you a new heart. Now that don't mean they're going to give us one like when we go to the heart hospital for a transplant. He's going to change your heart. And the new heart is not the stony old heart, but once you become a believer, it's a fleshly heart that God can touch and feel and work with. Then he said, I will put my spirit within you. You know, we trust Jesus as Savior. We're immediately sealed by the power of the Holy Spirit in our souls, and that's on the inside of us. And then he said, he'll take the old stony heart out of our flesh and give us the heart of flesh. In verse 27, he again reminds us, I'll put my spirit, the spirit of God, within you and cause you, doesn't say let you, cause you to walk in my statutes and to keep my judgments and to do those. Now, if we go over to the book of Daniel, just a few books over, we're going to find something interesting I want to share with you there in chapter 5. In chapter 5, of course, Daniel's gone through a series of interpreting and so forth and so on, but let me read to you about what one man did. Belshazzar the king, verse 5, chapter 1, made a great feast to a thousand of his lords and drank wine before the thousand. Belshazzar, whilst he tasted the wine, commanded to bring the golden and silver vessels which his father Nebuchadnezzar had taken out of the temple which was in Jerusalem. Now, they were just drinking out of their regular vessels. I'm sure they were probably gold and silver too. But he says, now I want you to go get the ones daddy took out of the temple in Jerusalem. And then he says, and the king and his princes, wives and concubines that they might drink therein. Then they brought the golden vessels that were taken out of the temple of the house of God, which was at Jerusalem, and the king and his princes and wives and concubines drank in them. 
They drank the wine and praised the gods of gold and of silver and of brass, of iron, wood, and of stone. Now in verse 4, there's no mention of God. No mention of God beyond the fact they robbed it from his house. Okay? Now, one of the most important things that we have to understand is God has the ability to get our attention. <clears throat> and so, in verse 5 of the 5th chapter, In the same hour came from the fingers of a man's hand and wrote over against the candlesticks upon the plaster of the wall of the king's palace. And the king saw a great part of that hand that wrote. And the king's countenance was changed. His thoughts troubled him. So the joints of his loins were loosed and his knees smote one against another. He got the shakes bad. Yeah. And the king cried aloud to the astrologers, the Chaldeans, the soothsayers, that's fortune tellers. And the king spake and said to the wise men of Babylon, Whoever shall read this writing and show me the interpretation thereof shall be clothed with scarlet, have a chain of gold about his neck, and shall be the third ruler in the kingdom. Okay? Then came in all the king's wise men, and they could not read the writing, nor make known to the king the interpretation thereof. Now the reason they could is because they didn't know God. See? That's just like a person who's lost today who has never made a profession of faith in Jesus Christ, will tell you, I have trouble reading the Bible. Why do they have trouble reading the Bible? It's written as simply as it could possibly be written. They have trouble because they have no connection to it. When I was lost and you were lost, I had no connection to God's Word. I owned a copy. My mother made me go to church with her. I was taught to read it in Sunday school, but I didn't have a connection. You've got to have the connection of faith to make this book what it is for you. Then he says, <clears throat> down in verse 10, Now the queen, by reason of the words of the king and his lords, came to the banquet house, and the queen spake and said, O king, live forever. Let not thy thoughts be troubled thee, nor thy countenance be changed. There is a man in thy kingdom, in whom the spirit of the holy gods, in the days of my father, light and understanding and wisdom, like the wisdom of the gods was found in him, whom Nebuchadnezzar thy father, the king, and I, I say thy father, made master of the magicians, astrologers, childhood, and soothsayers. Now what's that mean? Daniel gets put in charge of those guys, but what's he going to do? He's not going to let them talk. See? He knows what they say is not worth anything. Okay? For as much as an excellent spirit of knowledge and understanding of interpreting dreams and showing hard sentences and dissolving th doubts were found in the same Daniel whom his king named Belshazzar, now let Daniel be called. He will show you the interpretation. All right. Now, we go down to verse 14. I have even heard of thee that the spirit of the gods is in thee, that the light and understanding is excellent wisdom is found in thee. That's what Belshazzar is saying. Okay? And now the wise men of Strauss have brought in before me that they should read the writing and make known to me the interpretation thereof, but they could not show that interpretation. Stop and think about something. We possess within us the greatest, most important knowledge the world has ever seen. There's nothing like the knowledge of Jesus. There's nothing like the salvation experience. There's nothing about the leadership and the guidance and the provision that God makes for the believer. He didn't know about that, okay? I, he didn't know it all. Then, all of a sudden, in verse 17, then Daniel answered and said before the king, Let thy gifts be to thyself, give thy rewards to another, yet I will read the writings unto the king and make known to him the interpretation. In the previous verse I didn't read, he talked about giving him some gifts. He didn't need any gifts. Thou, O king, the most high God, gave Nebuchadnezzar thy father a kingdom, majesty, glory, and honor. For the majesty that he gave unto him, all the people, nations, and languages, trembled and feared before him, whom he would slay, he would keep a slay, and who he would take their life, he would keep keep them alive. Whom he would set up, and whom he would put down. But every time you see that word in the Bible, you know you've got something coming. Okay. But you know, 
But when your father, Nebuchadnezzar's heart was lifted up and his mind was hardened in pride, that's that first sin of Satan, Satan, pride. God's word said pride goes before fall. When you see a prideful person, you can sit back and watch. It's going to happen. He was disposed from his kingdom's throne and took his glory from him. That's what God did. He took it all away from Nebuchadnezzar. We say, how did he do that? Well, I'm fixing to tell you. He was driven from the sons of men, and his heart was made like that of the beast, and his dwelling was with the wild asses. They fed him with grass like oxen. His body was wet with the dew of heaven till he knew, till he knew, recognized, accepted that the Most High God ruled in the hearts of men and that he appointed over it hoops over he will. And thou, his son, O Belshazzar, hast not humbled thy heart, though thou knowest all of this. But thou hast lifted up thyself against the king, Lord of heaven, have brought the vessels of the house before thee, and thou and thy lords and wives and concubines have drank wine in them. Thou hast praised the gods of gold and silver, iron, wood, and stone and brass, which see not, hear not, know not, and the God in whose hands thy breath is, and whose are all the ways that thou hast not glorified. Think about that verse. The God in whom your breath is. How do we know that we are no longer here? That body and soul have separated? We stop breathing. Okay? We stop breathing. That means God's called us. And he has stopped our breathing. He's the God of breath. Okay. Then we discover. Verse 24. Then was the part of the hand that was sent from him. That's from God. And this writing was written. This is the writing that was written. Mini, mini, tinkle, uposin. This is the interpretation of the thing. Mini, God has numbered your kingdom and finished it. Think about that. That means God has looked at every soul, evaluated every soul, if they're a believer or a non-believer, and your and your kingdom is finished. Okay. That would be pretty disturbing, I would imagine. Tikel, thou art weighed in the balances, and you're found wanting because you don't have God in your life. As a non-believer, when God weighed us, we had not Jesus. And so we were, we needed, we needed, we were lacking in, in the strength and the weight. But when we trust Jesus, our scales are balanced. Thy kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and the Persians. That's his enemies. Then commanded Belshazzar, they clothed Daniel with scarlet, put a chain of gold about his neck, made a proclamation concerning him that he should be the third ruler in the kingdom. And in that night, Belshazzar, king of the Chaldeans, was slain. And Darius the Median took his kingdom, being about threescore and thirty-two years old. Now, all of a sudden, God sent a message. The message he sent was a personal message. It was to him, but it was also to what? It was to his people. Okay? Now, God is not going to ask something of the king that he does not ask of his people. Now think about that for just a minute. God's not going to do that. He is going to separate exactly like he wants it done. And that is the reason. Now I want you to take your Bible. Let's go to the New Testament for just a moment. And we're going to discover here in the book of Mark what God wants us to talk about here. I'm going to go down, if I might, please, to the... Let's go to verse 25 of the fifth chapter. A certain woman which had an issue of blood for 12 years, she had suffered many things of the physicians, had spent all that she had obtained, her money's gone, there was nothing better, and she did, she just got worse and worse. When she had heard that Jesus had come into the press or crowd, she came in behind him and touched his garments. 
Let's, let's talk about faith a moment. How much faith do you have to have to realize that even the very garment of the Lord will be filled with his spirit? And she came in, and in my visual of my own mind, this is not scriptural, in the vision of my own mind, she probably knelt down and reached between some people and just touched the hem, way down at the bottom, right almost on the ground. To do this, she had to do what? She had to bow before him, and she touched the hem of his garment. And then she said to herself, if I may but touch the, his clothes, I shall be made whole. That's faith, in, isn't it? If I can but ask Christ to be my Savior and forgive, ask him to re repent of my sins, I shall be saved. Then he goes further. Her fountain of blood dried up immediately, straightway. That means immediately. And she felt in her body that she was healed of the plague. What she's thinking, everything's going to be all right. You know, when you trust Jesus, your Savior, everything's going to be all right. We know that. Jesus, immediately knowing in himself that his virtue had gone out of him, turned about in the press and said, Who touched my clothes? His disciples said to him, Thou see the multitude thronging thee and say, Who touched my clothes? How could we possibly know? Okay. Well, he knew. He knew. And he looked around about to see her that had done the thing. But the woman, fearing and trembling and knowing what was done in her, came and fell down before him and told him all the truth. And he said to her, Daughter, thy faith has made you whole. Now, this morning there's only one way to be whole, and that's by faith in Christ. It's not faith in the doctor. It's not faith in the president. It's not faith in anybody else. It's only in Jesus. Now, let's go to Luke chapter 15 for just a moment. In this wonderful passage, I want you to look at chapter 15 of Luke, verse 10. And if you write in your Bible or whatever, you put a little star beside it or circle of verse, the number 10. Likewise, I say unto you that there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner... That repents. Joy in the presence of the angels when one soul repents. Think about that. What does that tell you? Every single soul is important. Amen. Every single soul needs the Master's blood to cleanse them by faith. And when we talk about 247 million people in our country who have no relationship to Jesus Christ, if they don't get something done before the breath leaves, they're not going to go to heaven. They're not going to go to heaven. A man told me one time, well, I just believe that when it's all said and done, we'll all get to go to heaven. I said, let me tell you why that's not true. He said, what makes you think it's not true? I said, well, this is what makes you think it's not true. If everyone was going to get to go to heaven automatically, okay, why would God have sent Jesus to the cross? Why would God have him humiliated like he was on the cross? Why would God have had him pay that price if it wasn't going to make any difference anyway? Okay? It's important. It distinguishes believer from non-believer. It, it brings about a relationship in which one knows and one does not know. Okay? The difference between every person on the face of the earth who's ever been here is do you know him or do you not know him? See? All the sacrifices of the Old Testament law brought year after year after year after year. And when those sins were confessed to that priest and the offering was accepted and the offering was utilized on the altars it's supposed to be for that individual sin they confessed, it all points forward to, to the cross. Amen. See? The Bible said not by the blood of bulls and goats and pigeons can our sins be forgiven. But that reminds us we made a sacrifice, we made a confession, we made an acceptance, we had a belief, and it's validated at the cross. When Jesus Christ died, you see. 
I remember one time going into a large building many years ago. I went to see a man on business, and when I got through, I started to leave, and I thanked the secretary for her courtesy. She said, just a minute, I need to validate your parking. So I dug my little coupon out that I had gotten a little ticket, and she wrote across it and put a stamp on it. And I said, well, I appreciate that. I hadn't thought about it, but when I got downstairs and went to leave the building, when I pulled up and I handed him that, he said, no charge. No charge. I didn't have to pay to get out. Okay? They let you go in for free. You got to pay to get out. Okay? That's kind of like casinos. They let you go in for free, but they take your money before you get out. Anyway, and so, you know, it's like that with Jesus. See? For you to get out of this world and be in the new kingdom of heaven, you have to have a validated soul. That means washed in the blood of Jesus by faith. That's your validation. Okay? We won't have to carry no ticket with us. See? Because we've already had the experience. Okay? That's the reality of how important it is to know the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, in this 15th chapter of the book of Luke, back up in verse 7, he says, I say unto you that likewise joy shall be in heaven of one sinner that repents more than ninety and nine just persons who have no repentance, need no repentance. What did he do with the 99 sheep he had? That, he put them in a fold, didn't he? He sealed up the little corral around them, and he went looking for the one that was lost. I was that lost sheep. You were that lost sheep. Okay? And God came looking for you. He provided you with the Spirit. He provides you with the knowledge. He provides you with the understanding. But you still have to make the choice. See? Remember old King Agrippa, he said, Paul, almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. Folks, we don't know how close he was, but he was close. See, that only counts in horseshoes and hand grenades. Okay? But a hand grenade, you don't have to be right on them. You just get close. It'll do the job. And if you can't get, rig the post, then your horseshoe don't mean a lot, does it? So it's all about the finished product. The finished product. Now, we all quickly know the story of the young prodigal son who said to his father, give me my portion of the inheritance and I'm going to go out and have a good time. And the father did what he asked him to do. He divided it up and off he went. I want you to read with me about, about what happens here. Verse 13 of Luke 15. Not many days after the younger son had gathered all together, he took his journey in a far country and there wasted his substance with riotous living. He wasn't following the tent revival, was he? No. He took it, everything he had and spit it on the world, what the world could offer. Many today seek fame. They seek fortune. They seek tangible items. They, they are always striving to have the biggest and the best of every single thing in the world. And there's nothing wrong with that unless you leave Jesus out. So if you leave Jesus out, it doesn't really mean anything. There's no joy without the acknowledgement that all we have comes from Jesus. And how we can say thank you to him every day for that, you see. You know, you just, we can just look around us and see those things happening, okay? Then it says, when he had spent everything he had in verse 14, there was a mighty famine in the land. He began to be in want. He's out of money and out of friends, you know. Then it says, he went and joined himself to assist that country, and he sent him into the fields to feed the swine. This is a Jewish boy. He's down here to slop the hogs. Okay? They didn't raise hogs. They didn't have anything to do with hogs. But he was down there doing slopping the hogs. When I was about 10 or 11 years old, I was out with my grandfather one time, and I had that job. It's not a nice job. It's not a nice job. It wasn't. They weren't careful putting the stuff in there, so it got on your pants with a bucket bumped you, bumped you. When you got there, when you poured in, we had to pour it from a pretty high spot, so it splattered everywhere. Now, I will say this much. The hogs liked it, but Doug didn't, you see. And then he says, He would fain have filled his belly with the husk that the swine did eat. No man gave unto him. Nobody provided for him. He was thinking about eating that husk that got mixed in with the, the slop. 
because he was hungry. Hungry. As a child, many times I went to bed hungry. I remember that still today. Okay? I don't like to be hungry. Well, y'all can see that, can't you? You can see that. I don't like to be hungry, you know? man asked me one time, he says, how come you eat so much? I said, I don't ever want to be hungry again. I said, if I ever get big enough to work and make money, I'm never going to be hungry again, and I'm never going to be broke. Never going to be broke. I remember being with guys, we'd go in the store, and they had money for cookies or soft drinks. Doug didn't have that. If I didn't find some change on the street, I couldn't go to the movie. I couldn't buy a cookie. I couldn't get a Coke. I spent more time crawling under the bleachers of the ball field in Sherman, Texas than most people ever thought about. It would kick. Some days it could be pretty proper. Once I found two quarters, I said, I am rich. I'm rich. I can go to the movie three times and have Cokes and just I was rich, man. Rich with fifty cents. Okay. Now look at this. No man gave it to him. And he came to himself. Now this is realization. He realized, hey, I had a real good deal back at the house. I never was hungry. I never had a, I had a job. I had a place to stay. I had somebody who loved and cared for me. I had provision. As a new believer in Christ, that's what we have. We have a place to go to. We have a God who loves us. We have a clean experience of being cleansed and made whole. We have a future provided for us with the best retirement in the country. Because it's not in this old place, is it? Okay? So he said, You know, no man gave me. And when he came to himself, he said, How many hired servants of my father have enough bread and to spare, and I'm perishing with hunger? I will arise and go to my father. I'm going to go back home. I'm going to go back home. Verse 20. I'll rise and go to my father, and I will tell him, tell him two things. I've sinned against heaven. What was that? The way he spent his money, right, just living, doing the wrong, living the wrong lifestyle. And two, before his father, I should have listened. I should have stayed home. I should have never left. I'm no more worthy to be called your son. Make me as one of your hired servants. And he arose and came to his father, and when he was yet a great way off, the father saw him, had compassion, and ran, and fell on him his neck, and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I am no more worthy to be called your son. But the father said to the servant, Bring forth the best robe, put it on him, put a ring on his hand, put shoes on his feet, bring hither the fatted calf, and kill it. Let us eat and be merry. Oh, i am tell you. You know what I've always envisioned? I've shared it with you many times. I think every day that father was out there sitting on that front porch looking down that lane. I think every day he prayed that boy would come back. And I think every day he had faith that one day God would direct him back. See? And while he didn't know what day, he was ready, wasn't he? He was prepared. He didn't have to say, well, now that you're back, let me see what we ought to do. No. Put the best robe in the house on him. Put a gold ring upon his finger. Put shoes upon his feet. He was not too good a shape when he got back. Not near like what he did when he left. See, this is the way it works. Think about ourselves this morning. When we were lost and we came to ourselves and we knew we needed to speak with God and we came to trust Jesus, what a wonderful day that was. Many times I've said to you as a congregation, if I could just give you anything, I'd give you the, the same joy and peace and enthusiasm and excitement that you had the day you became a Christian. Because the devil will wear that out of you if you're not careful. He will whittle you down. Let's take our Bible and go to John's Gospel of the New Testament. I want you to stop off with me, would please, in the 10th chapter in the first verse. John writes to us from the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Truly, truly, I say unto you, he that enters not by the door into the sheepfold, but climbs up some other way, the same as a thief and a robber. Nothing 
get you there with Jesus. It's not your tithes. It's not your work in the church. It's not the things you do. It's not your moral behavior. It's not any of those things. If you don't know Jesus, you don't get there. Look what the Bible says. He that enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the porter opens, and the sheep hear his voice. He calleth them by his own sheep by name and leads them out. God knows your name. In the Old Testament book of Prophecies, his day hand, his name is engraven upon your hand. Okay? See? This is like if I would take a pen and write it on my hand this morning. And I probably would just show you, but I forgot to bring a pen. But anyway. Then he says, When he putteth forth his own sheep, he goes before them. You're not driven by Jesus, you're led by Jesus. You've got to remember that. Okay? The devil will try to push you, but Jesus simply leads you. And the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. A stranger they will not follow, but will flee from him, for they know not the voice of the stranger. In verse 7, Then Jesus said to them again, Truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All that ever came before me are thieves and robbers. Look how many thousands of ideologies there are. In the Library of Congress, we have over 5,400 registered cults. They get the same tax break we get. Okay? But they don't teach Jesus. They don't talk about salvation. They don't talk about cleansing. They don't talk about one day being simply asleep in your faith in Jesus Christ. They don't talk about resurrection. They don't talk about heaven. Who wants that? Well, who wants to miss that? I am the door. By me, if any man come in, if any man, it says, and turn the page, enters in, he shall be saved. And you know, the Bible's written in male gender, so it's he or she. May be saved and shall go in and out and shall find pasture. And that's provision. There's no greater provision than the provision of faith in Christ, the washing of his blood shed at Calvary, the victory of his resurrection, the challenge of his promise to come again and the realization that we will have a lifetime with him if we just trust him today. Then he says in verse 11, verse 10 rather, the thief, that's Satan, comes not but to kill and steal and destroy. I'm come that you might have life and might have it more abundantly. Now, one day a man said to me, this is so, bad, so it's almost funny, but he was serious at the time. This is, Long when I was just first preaching, and uh, he was my Sunday school class, and hadn't been there very long. And he came, and after the class, he asked a question. I said, "Sure." And he said, "I don't understand. What's this abundant life mean? What's it mean? Have it more abundantly." Okay. Abundance is a word that talks about having more than the base line. Okay. With Jesus, since you have salvation. And the rest of the world doesn't have salvation. You have an abundant life, don't you? And we forget that a lot of times. We have an abundant life in Jesus Christ. Okay? We're not like the rest of the world. We're different. And we can call upon that abundance. We can call upon God's Spirit for direction. We can call about, pray our prayers in the name of Jesus and have them acted upon by God. All these things are part of the abundant life that we have in Jesus Christ. Now, in John eleven twenty five, you probably have this memorized. I learned it many years ago. This is Jesus talking to Martha. Now, Martha was the sister of Lazarus. And Martha was pretty well focused on Jesus. And her sister, Mary, was focused on getting the house ready, cleaning the house, and, and getting the house ready and fixing dinner for Jesus. Now, I don't have to tell you all this, but Martha was the smartest one of all. When we're focused on Jesus, the rest of it don't really matter. She could have gone outside and built a little pit of rocks and a few sticks and cooked lunch, and he'd have been just as happy, wouldn't he? Yes. But you have to understand your focus. 
So Martha says to him in verse 24, I know that he that Lazarus, my brother, shall rise again in the resurrection at the last day. And Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. If you don't know Jesus, you won't have a, you'll have a resurrection, but it won't be the life. Amen. You know, it'll be the judgment to the pits of hell where the fire burns and you never go out. Okay? I am the resurrection of the life. He that believes in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. Death is just a doorway through which we have to pass. It's just another experience that we have to endure because of our life stay here. As the old man says, nobody gets out of life alive. Amen. You know, well, we don't, you know. <laughs> uh, now, let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, please. This is really a beautiful passage. It begins in verse 51. It's only got seven verses. But let's look at it together, please, before we close. Paul is writing to the church in Corinth, his first letter, and he says, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. What's he mean? Not all of us are going to die in our faith. Others will be changed when God calls for us. Now think about that. That's what is going to happen. Okay? In a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, the trumpet shall sound. The dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. Now, we get a brand new body in the resurrection. And we will be called out to meet the Lord in the air. Do not ever tell anybody that means they get wings because we're not going to fly up there. Okay? Every time I see a play or something where a little kid's got a set of wings on the back, I think, oh, what a terrible thing. God's power will raise us up. We won't have to have wings. We won't have to flap our like a bird, but we shall all be changed. This corrupter will put on incorruption. That's what Jesus had. This mortal will put on immortality. As a mortal person, I know I will face death one day, or if the Lord comes, I'll still be changed. If he comes before I get through, then they'll rise first, and we'll be changed and join them in the air to meet the Lord in the air. So shall we ever be with the Lord. When this corruption, corruptible shall have put on incorruption, this mortal shall put on immortality, then shall we brought to be brought to, brought to pass the saying that was written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? And O grave, where is thy victory? The grave won't hold us and death won't hold us. The sting of death is sin and the strength of sin is in the law. But thanks be to God which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now he tells us one verse in 58. Therefore, my beloved brethren, that means we're believers, be you steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that the, your labor is not in vain in the Lord. God is going to take care of us irrespective of what we think. Now if you take those points this morning, they help us to know three things. Okay. Knowing Christ will make you different. Knowing Christ will change your in place for eternity. Knowing Christ will set you apart while you're here. So for those things in perspective this morning, as I look out across the crowd, I wish that 247 million could show up right here at one time. You see? But until they come to themselves, just like the young boy down slopping the hogs, until we come to ourselves and realize we need Jesus, and then we've come to acknowledge him as Lord of our life, to ask him for forgiveness of our sins, to accept the wonderful salvation he extends to us, until that happens, we're part of the 247. And in that, I have relatives, I have friends, I have co-workers. Okay? I've done my best to witness to all of them through the years. So far, I've not led them one to Jesus. But it won't be because they don't know about it. It won't be because they didn't have an opportunity. It won't be because there wasn't something told to them that opens 
the light as much as can be if they want to turn on the stream. It's kind of like saying, I've hooked up your electrical cables, your lights will work, but you have to turn them on yourself. I can't come in your house and turn them on, but I've got them, the power's at the box. Okay. And so that's exciting for us, you see, to realize that. And so it's our prayer today that we can become motivated to tell the story, to live the story, to become the story for the honor of Jesus, not for ourselves. Join us as we pray. Father, we come before you today. Again, we want to thank you for Jesus who kept his commitment in the garden that your will above his always be done. I thank you that you gave his life for us and that he stood in full agreement upon that cross. I realize the power of the message, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Because God could no longer stand with him because the moment of death was near and God could have nothing to do with sin. His precious word says Jesus became sin for us. So if I was honest this morning, my sins put Christ on the cross. Not only did he die for me, but he died for everyone else who will come and trust him. Faith is not free. A couple of weeks ago, about four, five or six weeks ago, just before I got sick, one somebody said to me in a restaurant, said, faith is free. And I said, no, faith is not free. Someone had to die to make faith available. Amen. His name was Jesus. Freedom is not free. Our men had to die on foreign fields to keep our freedom. So it's not free. Faith is not free. Freedom is not free. Choice is free. We ask now that you look out across each one of us and it's our prayer that as we've come to know Jesus that we might grow in strength and, and the knowledge of the Lord and be able to come become greater witnesses for him in the time in which we live. For those listening who will listen this morning, it's our prayer if you need Jesus that you'll trust him today. Simple childlike faith. Saying, Jesus, I want to ask you to forgive me of my sins. I want you to come into my heart. I want you to become the Savior of my life. And Jesus will do that if you call upon him. Bless us now in these moments and forgive us our sins. In Jesus' name, amen. I'd surely fail Without him I would be drifting Like a ship without a sail Jesus, oh Jesus Do you know him today? Do not turn him away Oh Jesus, oh Jesus Without him, how lost I would be. Without him, I would be dying. Without him, I'd be enslaved. Without him, I would be hopeless. But with Jesus, thank God I'm safe. Jesus, oh Jesus. Us. Do you know him today? Do not turn him away. Oh, Jesus, oh, Jesus, without him, how lost I would be. All right, you may be seated. We're going to get ready for our baptismal service, and uh, that'll take us just a few minutes. And... Uh, Are you going to assist her? Okay. And, uh, huh? Yeah, we'll move the puppet. Whatever you want.
you want to do. Pick it up and move it? I want you just to slide it. You need some help? And finally, the last we were, it was like ice. And he thought that was really funny. This morning we have come to baptize our sister in Christ, Shelly Irwin, and she's a born-again Christian, and she's come this morning to follow the Lord in scriptural baptism. I know you realize this doesn't save you, it's just a picture of the day when you were put under the blood of Christ by faith. And so she's going to do this. So when she says to somebody, I've been baptized, or if they ask if you've been baptized, when she says yes, then they know that she is a born-again believer. Now for profession of thy faith, in obedience to his command, I baptize thee, my sister, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, buried in the likeness of his burial, rising to walk in the newness of life. Amen. 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 I'm sorry the water may get a little cold. It's all right. We all get in trouble with the pump yeah. over the heater. We should just be real careful then.